I'm Helen Castor, I'm a medieval historian and I have a particular interest in the reign of Richard II and the Lancastrians who followed him. Today we're on a fantastic school outing for the company. We're visiting Westminster Hall, which is one of the last surviving bits of the medieval Palace of Westminster and a place that was hugely important in Richard's reign. Clearly our interest in the hall is, as is evidenced by all the white hearts that's carved into the, into the lintel there, um, is the fact that Richard II transformed this space. Westminster Hall is absolutely bound into the heart of Richard's story. It was a place that was clearly very important to him. It was already 300 years old by the time Richard came to the throne. He took this ancient space and made it his own. He commissioned an astonishing new wooden roof and onto this roof he stamped his badges. There are angels holding up the beams all the way along and each of them is holding Richard's coat of arms and his personal badge of the White Heart is all the way along the top of the walls. A statement of Richard's idea of his kingship. The great irony is that this work was going on in the very last years of his reign. So the first formal state occasion that took place in Richard's remodelled Westminster Hall was the formal process of his deposition at the Parliament of 1399. It can be very difficult to get behind the scenes of the Middle Ages to find out about people's personalities, people's characters. But actually, of all our medieval kings, we stand more of a chance of putting together a character study of Richard than we do almost of anyone else, I think. And that's largely because his life was so extraordinary. He became king when he was just 10 years old. So at the age of 10, he was crowned in the Abbey here in Westminster an extraordinary ceremony, not only of, of worldly pomp, but also of religious significance. He was anointed, God's anointed, after that ceremony. And then at the age of 14, the Peasants' Revolt happened here in London, and it was Richard who rode out to take a leading role in quelling the rebels. He said, I will be your leader, I am your king. Now you put those events together and you get a very powerful effect on a young mind. The mind of a boy who's being told that he is God's representative on earth and that he has power to command all his subjects, all his dominions. And that does seem to have had a lasting effect on Richard. Shakespeare's vision of Richard is very interesting. He does take liberties with his subjects. Some of the ages are different, some of the chronology gets changed and so on. But in essence, at the heart of Shakespeare's conception of Richard is something very powerful, I think, for our understanding of the historical Richard. In terms of the politics, he's got so much spot on. Richard's decision to confiscate Bolingbroke's estates after the death of his father, John of Gaunt, was the key moment in bringing to a head all the long drawn out conflicts that had plagued Richard's reign. And it was key for exactly the reasons that are explained in the play, that if a king can abrogate the law purely at his own will, to the extent of disinheriting the heir to the greatest magnate in the whole country, if the king can click his fingers and take those lands for himself, where is the security for anyone? And that shows us exactly how Richard had misunderstood his role as king, because the fundamental role of a medieval king was to provide his subjects with security. If he didn't give them that security, the whole kingdom was lost. One of the reasons I love medieval history so much is that we can't know everything. It's like doing a jigsaw, but with half the pieces missing. So we know a very great deal, but most of the records that we have that are exactly contemporaneous are governmental records, they're administrative records, they're formal, they're technical. What we don't have for the most part, behind the scenes bits of information, the private letters, the the ability to get right into the room. So as a medieval historian, you're always working with your imagination. You have to, in order to supply the human element that we know is there, we just can't usually get at it with the fullness we'd like. So to have a text written with all the understanding of human nature that Shakespeare has, and the command of language, and the understanding of the nuances of politics, all of that can only feed the imaginative process that has to feed into our understanding of history anyway. So it is a fantastic resource, I think, in making us think about the human reality of a process. History seems very neat when we tell stories with hindsight, but for the people living through it who didn't know what was going to happen next, who were having to make split-second calculations without knowing what the consequences were going to be, that's what we see play out in Shakespeare's play. And even if we can correct bits and pieces here and there, we still learn such a lot.